Good morning and we come to God's Word this morning. In many ways the Easter Sunday sermon almost picks and preaches itself. Whilst the passage may change the topic is almost invariably the resurrection. As I look back over my previous Easter Sunday sermons I notice that my go-to passage seems to have been 1 Corinthians 15 for understandable reasons, though I was surprised by the range of passages that I have used on Easter Sunday. However, the biggest challenge of preaching on Easter Sunday is keeping the message fresh and real, for the resurrection is such an important subject that it is preached all throughout the year, not just at Easter. So this year, having been reflecting on the Gospel of Mark through Holy Week, as you may have noticed from the Good Friday service, it is unsurprising that I should turn to the same Gospel for this Easter Sunday morning message. However, using Mark's Gospel account of the resurrection has been more challenging than I had expected it to be, both in terms of the text and what God has been saying to me. I don't know about you, but as we led the youth group last week, I realised how all the gospel accounts seem to merge together in our minds to give us a, a combined account. While this does have some benefits, it can obscure the detailed reading of any one account, which is starkly illustrated in the gospel account from Mark. So this morning we're going to read Mark's account of the resurrection and consider what we can learn from it. So please turn with me now to Mark 16 and let's read from the first eight verses. Mark chapter 16 verses 1 to 8 and you will need your Bible in front of you so if you haven't got one please do pause and go and get your Bible and then come back and start again or start from where you left off. So we're going to read Mark 16, 1 to 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb. But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell the disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went off and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Before we continue, let's take a moment to pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. As we come now to seek to understand what you're saying to us this morning, we pray that you might, might speak by the power of your Holy Spirit, that we would have ears to listen, and that once we have listened, we would have hearts and wills that would obey you and do as you are calling us to do. So help us, Lord, this morning as we seek to understand more about the resurrection. In Jesus' name, Amen. To provide us a map of where we're going this morning, we're going to consider the passage under three headings, the three M's. The marginal note, the main text, and the maybe ending. I guess that most of you will have spotted that I stopped the reading at the end of verse 8. And I guess for some of you, you might be wondering why. Others will not have noticed at all, and some may have worked out what is going on. So let's bring me straight to the first point, the marginal note. 
If you have your Bibles in front of you, which I hope you do, you may notice a marginal note at the start of verse 9, which is often indicated by a superscript letter A next to the verse number. If you then look in the margin or the footer, you will find an A there with an explanation that says something like this. The most reliable early manuscripts and other ancient witnesses do not have Mark 16, 9 to 20. When we find these sort of things in the Bible, it can cause some concern, as we don't expect to find uncertainty in the inerrant word of God. We tend to struggle with uncertainty, so if verses 9 to 20 are included in our Bibles, we tend to read on regardless. However, as most of us have been Christians for some time, I want to challenge us to dig a little deeper. Read what different commentators say to work out what we think about this passage. If we ever do do any digging, it is easy to pick up our favourite Bible teachers and listen to what they say and simply take their view rather than weigh up the alternatives. David Pawson, recognising the ragged ending, as he says, of Mark's Gospel, suggests that there are three possible explanations for this. Mark intended to finish the Gospel this way at the end of verse 8. Mark was prevented from finishing the Gospel, so it ended abruptly at verse 8. For example, he was arrested mid-sentence. Excuse the pun. Or uh, Mark finished the gospel neatly, but the ending was torn off and lost, maybe by persecutors or, or someone along the way uh, tore off that final bit of the text. David Pawson suggests that the first option is highly unlikely and says, it seems as if somebody has picked out various elements from the other gospels, put them together and rounded Mark off in that way. We need not worry about the authenticity of the longer ending. It is a valid part of the word of God and does reflect the early Christian understanding, even if it does not deliver Mark's actual words. Now you may go along with that, uh, but I hope you will dig a little deeper. One of the foremost contemporary New Testament scholars, Tom Wright, says, of course, there are many who think that Mark did, after all, intend to close the book with the women in fear and silence. But I disagree. I have become quite sure that there was more. I think a very, very early copy of Mark was mutilated. As with many other scrolls and books in the ancient world, and sometimes even in the modern, the last page or the last column of the scroll was torn off, presumably, by accident. Whilst Tom Wright comes to a similar initial conclusion to David Pawson, rather than the read on regardless approach, Tom Wright says, we can make a theological virtue out of necessity. Perhaps in the strange providence of God, the way Mark's book now finishes encourages us all the more to explore not only the faith of the early church, that Jesus had indeed risen from the dead, but our own faith. There is a blank at the end of the story and we are invited to fill it in ourselves. Do we take Easter for granted or have we found ourselves awestruck at the strange new work of God? What do we know of the risen Lord? Where is he now going ahead of us? What task has he for us to undertake today to take the gospel of the kingdom to the ends of the earth? My purpose in focusing on this marginal note is to bring two challenges. Firstly, take time to read scripture more carefully, study it and even allow ourselves to consider alternative views that will challenge our thinking. More of that later. And secondly, to allow the difficulty of the ending of Mark's Gospel to cause us to explore afresh the impact of the resurrection on our faith. Again, more of that later. 
perhaps we can ask ourselves, what if this was how Mark had intended the Gospel to end? Anyhow, now let's turn to the main text, the undisputed part of Mark's Gospel that we've just read in verses 1 to 8. As the passage is so short, let's refresh our memories by rereading it now. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll away the stone from the entrance to the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go and tell the disciples and Peter. He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. There is so much on which we could focus in these few verses, and I'm sure that many of you will be able to pull out some wonderful lessons from them. But this morning I felt I should focus on three Fs. Females, fallacies and fear. I have heard people pick up on the role of the women in the Gospels and particularly in the Passion narrative, and I'm sure many of you have too. Yet for all the positive messages found in the Gospels, I grew up in a church with a pseudo-Pauline perspective of women. You may have been there too, where women were seen as second-class Christians. If women were allowed to speak, then if a man expressed an alternative view, what the woman said was invariably ignored, even when what they said was wise and truthful. I grew up in a world without a dad, with just my mum and three older sisters, and it still saddens me to think that my mum, who knew her Lord and his word more than most, was for most of her life limited to teaching little ones and rarely listened to in matters of the church. I recognise that that view was cultural and the church has changed, as has my view. But this week, as I considered the Easter story, I was challenged by an article that Deb sent me, written by a woman who I admire greatly, Amy or Ewing. The article is in Christianity Today, and it was entitled From the Empty Tomb to Today's Abuse, Believe Women. I would like to commend this article to you and express this desire that you go away and read it. Look it up on the internet. From the empty tomb to today's abuse. Believe women. The article makes the point that the central facts of the Christian faith were all primarily witnessed by women. If we don't believe women, then we have to dismiss the eyewitnesses to the incarnation atonement and resurrection. If we won't listen, we don't have access to the evidence for the central truths of the Christian faith. Amy relates this to the current abuse scandals and concludes with the challenge that believe women is an Easter message without a doubt. While this may not be the main message that we find in the Easter story, nonetheless it is one that is often made and perhaps particularly pertinent at this time. We need to take seriously the witness of women. Rather than simply dismiss their views or even depreciate them in favour of a male view. Now our second F, or our second focus, is fallacies. And this relates to the words of the young man sitting in the empty tomb. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. 
when it comes to the resurrection, people point to the empty tomb as ed evidence of the resurrection. But the young man did not say, he is not here, therefore he has risen. But rather, he is risen, he is not here. It is a fallacy to think that the empty tomb is a conclusive proof of the resurrection. Even at the time, others suggested that Jesus' body had been stolen by the disciples. So that was their conclusion for the empty tomb. The resurrection is not something for which we have or can find simple historical or scientific evidence that would be compelling today. With the Gospel of Mark ending here, all we have to go on is the young man telling the women that the G what Jesus said would happen has happened. The most convincing proof of the resurrection is an encounter with the risen Lord. Our job as Christians is to point people in the right direction to find him so that they can have an encounter with the risen Lord. Our third F, our third focus, is fear, which is found in the final verse of the main text of Mark. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. We can see why the, another ending was added to the Gospel, whether Mark wrote an original one or not. For the ending is neither positive nor victorious as we would like. One author puts it this way, even after God's revelation had taken place in Jesus' resurrection, mystery, fear and failure remain. Whilst this is the end of Mark's part of the Gospel, it is not the end of the story. For we know that Jesus' resurrection was proclaimed and is still being proclaimed throughout the world, just as Jesus said it would be. This rather dismal conclusion to the Gospel only serves to encourage us that despite our fear, bewilderment and failure, God can and will fulfil his promises through us. He is risen. This message of the resurrection will be proclaimed throughout the world through us, even if we are afraid, confused and fail. It is not our merit, but his grace. Praise the Lord. In the middle of the Covid crisis, when life is topsy-turvy, this is the Easter message that we need to hear and proclaim. And we come to our third M, the maybe ending. For those who like their endings nice and neat, here is the maybe ending of the Gospel of Mark. When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping. When they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had sent him, they did not believe it. Afterwards, Jesus appeared in a, diff in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country. These returned and reported it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptised will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on the sick people and they will get well. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and he sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word, confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. 
I am not going to try and expand on this, but simply to say this. Whichever ending to the gospel you choose, Mark's one, a shorter one, or the longer one, the story of the good news of the resurrection continues in and through us. How are you filling in the blank at the end of the story, to use N.T. Wright's words? This morning's message is unlike any Easter message I have ever preached, for reading this gospel has challenged me in so many ways. I trust that you are well aware of the resurrection, Jesus' triumph over death, and just how life-changing that can be. If not, please give me a call and I'd love to share that with you. So this morning, rather than rehearse that message once again, I have sh shared some of the ways I have been challenged afresh by the Easter story. And I pass them on to you so that you too can be challenged afresh so that we can together, as Tom Wright puts it, fill in the blanks at the end of the story and see where he is now going ahead of us and what task he has for us to undertake today to take the gospel of the kingdom to the ends of the earth. To summarise the challenges that I have just shared, give time to really read and dig into scripture and allow it to challenge you. This is to read again the passion narrative and let God through the power of his spirit speak to you. Take more seriously the witness of women. Look for an encounter with the risen Lord, not just proof of his resurrection. Recognise that life is messy, confusing and so often we fail. So rely on God and his grace that he might fulfil his promises. Work out where Jesus has gone ahead of us and follow him there. This Easter, may God challenge you so that he can become more in you. May God in his grace bring the message of the risen Lord to our needy world through us by the power of his spirit. Let's conclude by asking God to do that as we continue to worship. Father God, we long that our world would have an encounter with the risen Lord. But Lord, we know that we must have fresh encounters with you day by day, that we might show forth your glory, your power, your love, your grace to a needy world. So help us, Holy Spirit, that we might day by day dig into your word and learn more of you. Thank you that despite our fear, failure and bewilderment and the messiness of our world and our lives, you in your grace speak to us and that you use us. We open ourselves to you this morning and ask that you would use us today and every day. For your glory and praise. Amen.